computer. Five, four, three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday, February 6th, 2022. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Doubter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Hello, Wombat. Yes, that is me. Hello, me. Yay. And George Brown, two and a half from Brooklyn originally, now of Tennessee. Welcome. Hi. Hello. And the John Richard from across the pond in England. Welcome, as always. Hello. And Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in town, then that's very doubtful. You are not. <laughs> in Knoxville, we have a group of over a thousand of us, and we're just a little town in, in the Bible Belt. So hang in there. there. You are not alone. We'll tell you more about the Atheist Society of Knoxville after the mid-show break. Wombat, what are we going to be talking about today? Today, we're talking about dietary dogma. And the idea that people could be just as skeptical of what they put into their bodies as what they put into their souls, should they even be proven to exist. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, I'd like to do a quick check on seeing how everyone's doing. John Richards, it's always good to see a weekly check-in. Still doing interviews, still publishing on Global Atheist News. How have you been? Yeah, I've been fine, thank you. Yeah. I've left COVID Mark II behind. And, Fantastic. Uh, I'm forging ahead now. Had a great um, Global Atheist News and a great Free Thought Hour yesterday. So, yeah, just go to Free Thought Productions to watch them. Oh, I'm plugging too soon. No, no, no. You can always plug. You're, you're a welcome friend on the show. Though, it was interesting that before we started recording, you were talking about how your daughter was learning piano. Now, yeah. just as a quick update, is it the sort of thing where it's like you hear her do a song and you're like, okay, she's getting close. Now I got to hear this 46 more times. Or is it sort of like, oh, yeah, turn that up. Yeah, we need to get her uh, a new thing. Like, how does that work out? Because it tends to be one of those sonorous instruments that you're like, get good at it already. It's like saxophone. Yeah, no, no, she's not, um, she's not turning into an earworm yet. Okay. She's, 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 it was interesting because I started off, we've got a keyboard. It's not a, it's an electronic piano, does all the voices, you know, the thing. Sure. And um, I started out, because I used to, I was taught piano when I way back. I've forgotten most of it. You but, taught uh, piano? No, I was taught piano. Oh, got it, got it, got it. As a, as a small boy between about six and eight. But I've, I, I got stuck then because my piano teacher was recommended to stop doing something. She was overworking and she stopped teaching me. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so I got stuck at that level. And then I took up guitar and, and bass and I ended up in up until about my late 30s in a band playing and singing that was Wowie. great i loved it wowie oh wait i loved how you transitioned to yourself when we you can't plug Sorry. you when yeah, we're yeah. talking about the kid yeah that was an intro to talking about the kid i saw your album coming mm -hmm. up out of frame was like and by the way i have this new, <laughs> new, new thing i'm telling right now we call ourselves john richards and the rockstones it's very good no mm -hmm. no no never never did that and no. the disbelievers how about that uh john rich is one last question i want to throw this one at you but is london bridge a sacrilegious song to learn how to play because it tends to be one of the london bridge is falling down are you familiar with the the song yeah yeah, yeah. okay no no it's it's fine it's an old folk song yeah and okay. london bridge has fallen down at least twice <laughs> i have not been aware of i didn't know that I'm, yeah i'm gonna have to and, look that up and and you've got one of them in arizona we have wow. a london bridge in arizona Yes, we sold it to you. You dismantled it and took it away block by block and reassembled it in Arizona. Wow. Well, Larry's looking that up. Hey, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you've also got you've also got the Queen Mary too. Okay, not bad. I know the Statue of Liberty came from France. So hey, yeah. it takes a whole community. George yeah, Brown, sure. would you mind taking yourself off mute? Give me a catch up on how you've been over the last week. Uh, can I just oh, say okay. oh yeah, go for it, John. I just wanted to say you have to import your history. <laughs> very true very true george how you been i'm trying to figure out what john just meant when it's he said uh, it's a uh, I, I don't want to explain the joke that's bad thing that's bad form isn't it right but anyway <laughs> okay. george Ryan, how you been over the last week 
Oh, I've been I've been fine. I've been drinking some Pete's coffee. It takes right. me it takes me seven minutes to grind each cup by hand. So I'm getting a workout grinding the Pete's coffee. And um, the other thing I'm doing, you may notice me changing headphones during this program. Okay. Um, I am attempting to understand you people better. Okay. Um, and, and I'm finding, even though I'm an audio expert, um, connecting to computers, to laptops especially, is so frustrating and confusing that uh, George, I'm really ha having to work at it. The only so, thing you have to do is get the chip in your ear that you get when you get vaccinated. You know? Oh, the other thing is... You select uh, that here, extra box. And then you're, you're here going. in my county, uh, this is the controversy. They've banned Mouse, yeah. which is a book that I imagine parodies Nazi Germany. M A U S. Well, it, it doesn't. No, it doesn't parody Nazi Germany. It's the story of the author's father, um, and the descent into fascism, and murdering of Jewish people. I mean, in particular, and various other kinds of people that the Nazis found undesirable, mm. as well. So. As told through like toy mouse or like uh, uh, cute mice, like with the aesthetics of almost looking like a children's book, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been meaning to read this for over 20 years, and uh, a fellow knocked on my door last week and handed me this copy. So um, I just finished reading it. Wow. And, um, I'm, you know, I, I, I think I see what the fuss is all about. It's got okay. some, some strong language on the very final page. Wow. And, and um, supposedly there's a picture of a naked person in this book, and I have not found it. <laughs> oh, well. The, uh -oh. The, I'm sure people are looking for it. <laughs> yeah. The fellow who lent it to me said that he would show me where it is. He, he dared me to see if I could find it, and I, I haven't been able to. I always, so he's I'm, always, I'm always worried when random people at my door give me, you know, Nazi yeah, books yeah. and tell me where the naked I, people I wanna are. Know, I want to know why you get decent books delivered and I have to put up with this trash. Sure, 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 sure. Let's keep moving on. Larry, how you been? Oh, fine. I've been losing myself in the in 3D world, the virtual world of, of <laughs> Quest 2. Not uh, bad. Yeah, I love this one app called Big Screen. Uh, oh, you sit in virtual theaters and, and watch movies or TV shows or just videos. They also uh, you can build your own room with a huge screen in it and invite people in, watch the movies and chat. So you can have friends like from across the ocean, watch sharing a, a, a like a virtual living room and watching a movie with you. You know, That's instead great. of having to get together, it's awesome. Yeah, keep enjoying it. I can tell you this. Enjoy your Oculus while it continues to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I'll throw out at that. Like Facebook, known for a lot of things, the, uh -huh. the integrity of their hardware is still questionable. So yeah, enjoy, yeah. It, enjoy, I it, am. enjoy it. Oh, I'm having, I'm having some issues. But generally, when connecting with the PC is the main thing. Okay, okay. Hey, uh, speaking of losing yourself, I'll throw out my thing. I've been losing myself literally with weight loss since December, and I made progress up to today of about 31 pounds since like mid-December. And that oh. runs out to an average of about two pounds a day, but I'm not tracking my weight daily. I'm doing it like once a week. I'm trying not to get stressed out on like weights. I'm making it as easy as possible. I'm not on Jenny Craig. I'm not on Weight Watchers. I'm not on Paleo. Uh, what is it? Keto. All these you know, trends, they all work but they all work on one premise basically. And that's maintaining a caloric deficit. So like, Hey, eat less than what you burn in a, in a day or a period of time. And if you do that, you are guaranteed to lose weight. Yeah. Composition it's the same, like, it's the same premise as, as making money. You spend, <laughs> spend less than you make. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And so like at the end of the day, it's just an input output thing. And when I saw on YouTube that just lying down, and not doing anything burns energy. I was like, what? There's a basal limit of energy that yeah. I'm burning. It's like, yeah, know what that number is. And then, you know, what? know how much you burn from working out if you do work out. And just make sure you always eat less than that and count the calories. Yeah. And I'm like, is it that simple? And I've totally did it. And it's like, is, is that simple? The fact is, though, um, 
I will, I've been going to work. And in fact, this is like my first XL shirt that I've worn in four years, five years or something like that. And it's fitting really comfortably. It's not like up on my sleeves and stuff. So I went to work and they're like, hey, it looks like you're losing weight. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm just eating less than um, what I'm burning on a daily basis. It's like I'm wearing smaller shirts. <laughs> right, right, right. They're like, no, no, no. But you got to not eat donuts or like you got to <laughs> stay away from kale or you got to make sure you're eating four chicken breasts a day. I'm like, no, no, dude, you can eat anything you want. Just make sure caloric deficit is being maintained. Like that's that's functionally how it works. And if I eat, yeah. if I know in my head I can eat whatever I want, I'm not <clears throat> under the condition where I'm craving food. So it's like, if right. I want pizza, I can eat pizza, but just got to make sure I burn more energy right. to make and, it. And the secret is to have a high ac activity in your life le level wise. Back, yep. I, there was a five year period I was dancing on TV and I was dancing literally no, you six can't, nights you a can't week. just casually say that and expect us not to, to hang on that for a bit. So you're <laughs> dancing on TV casually on. Yeah, there was a, there was a, an international show on the Nashville network called Club Dance. It okay. was a country western show. And if you remember the old American bandstand, they had people that were regulars that would come on there and dance. Yeah, it's like Soul Train. Right, like, but, right, but exactly. Country. Well, I was, a, I was a regular on club dance for about five years. Wow. And I could eat anything I wanted to and maintain a low weight because I was burning so darn many calories. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But people take that almost offensively, even if you try to explain, oh, it's just a calorie deficit. It's not that keto is yeah. necessarily a bad thing. And I wasn't a kid either. I was in my 40s. So. Larry, I'm trying to transition to the topic. <laughs> the topic being like some people took me saying, no, it's just a calorie deficit. That's how that, that diet with the trademark name at the end of it is working. They were like, no, because this worked for me. I had a personal and true experience with this weight loss system how dare you try to break it down into scientific terms that's not how it worked at all and i was just like <laughs> i kind of think it does and then and and i've had two levels of conversations one with people who are immediately offended with uh with any me not I'm immediately adhering to their weight loss program and if me breaking down to my simple they're like well that's not for me that doesn't work it's like you're doing the exact same thing i'm doing if you're losing weight that's how you lose weight and then the second one is um i asked people like in the process of you losing weight, like what changes have you found for you? It's like, oh, I've become way more aware of what's good to eat and what's not good to eat. I've become less reliant on the government telling me what's needed to be eaten. And I'm like, wow, you're asking a lot of questions. Like you must, did, has it changed how you think, you know, like health-wise, like health-wise, spiritual-wise, religious-wise, like religious-wise? It's like, yeah, I've become even more religious. I'm like, no, <laughs> if only you had the same amount of skepticism for your diets right. that you did for your gods. And mm -hmm. so- what I wanted to do is open up the topic of um, weight loss. Has anyone seen people be very dogmatic with the way how they lose weight and the idea of what kind of benefits would they get if they had a religion or a dietary, or if they applied dietary constraints to their religious views as well and thought about like, oh, maybe I should have the same amount of skepticism for what I consume versus what I pray to. John Richards, do you think I might be on a on an interesting track here? Well, you may be, but I'm just wondering. There's a mystery you could solve because all the waistbands of my underpants are shrinking. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been there too. Yeah, I've been there too. Don't sell them. Don't sell them. You never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've got um, and there's plenty of examples of people being dogmatic about various things it's a predilection of, of the theistic mindset mm. but i can't for the life of me at the moment just think of any particularly dietary related ones okay that's interesting well, so maybe it could just be the circles you're in but yeah a uh, larry go for it um, uh, uh, Jew jewish people and pork uh, you know and catholics and and uh fish on friday it's unleavened so. bread um you've got people who are just like hey i don't eat blank on sundays and it's just like, right what, right what, what's that about it's like my pastor told me not to i'm like well what's going on there jesus really likes wine and bread crackers for some reason it could have been any kind of food but he chose those two things it's weird george brown yeah, go on ahead i thought we were doing weight loss though sure 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 but i'm helping you out by throwing you topics <laughs> george what do you got what do you got well i just wanted to mention that uh about I grew up about eight blocks away from where Woody Allen grew up and then the same gen general neighborhood as Bernie Sanders. And um, it, there was a Jewish shopping street over where, um, where Woody Allen lived. 
And the Chinese restaurant there did a really great business among all the Jewish people who came in to eat pork. Okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I think pork's, pre pork's pretty good stuff. You pork know? is pretty good. It's kind of weird that they have you know, restrictions that you can't eat pork in a lot of religious fashion. Yeah. So for dietary loss specifically, I'll bring up a, a quick thing then. Did, and... did they come in? Did they come into the delis disguised, or were they out undercover, or were they out of the closet when they did it? The answer to that is too long, John. It depends upon which disguise you're talking about. I mean, if you you know, because we had all the all the different kinds of Jewish people, including the guys with the big fur coats, the black mm. fur coats in the summertime. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a I have a sister that lives in Pakistan, and when she came to visit us for a while, she remember we went to the grocery store, and the first thing she did was she pulled off products off the store and looked at the back, like where the nutrition facts were. And I thought she was looking at the calories and the protein content, but what she was actually looking for was a symbol on it to denote if that food was actually halal. And there's two concepts in Pakistan for haram and halal food, good food that you can eat religiously and bad food that you can't eat, or food that's deemed uh, improper or yeah. unclean for you to consume. And there's a very specific logo she was looking for. And because we were in an American store and it was like her first time being back, she didn't find any of that, even like in the Mediterranean section, Asian section. She's like, I don't think I can eat any of this food. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it's all like there are probably ingredients in the things that do have your logo that come from things that don't have that logo on them. And she's like, I'm I'm strictly up supposed to just eat these things because it's been working for me. It's the personal experience that I've had. And I've had a deep and close personal relationship with this system. And it's like, it's almost as if we were talking about our God without actually talking about our God. And if you look at her, she's like 60 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> she ended up only mostly eating eggs and chicken nuggets. Only those two things for the entire time she was with us. John Richards, what's up? Well, the thing about halal is mm -hmm. they, they kill all the animals without stunning them. So they're bled to death. And that's proved to be a big issue with the the vegan and vegetarian sector in our society. So there's currently a bill going through Parliament to try and prevent this non-stunning way of slaughter from happening. We want, we want to stun all the animals first before we kill them, which means um, either an electric water bath or a bolt gun, which is, you know, just a, a captive bullet that goes into and out of the skull to kill them instantly. Or um, in the case of chickens, we do it with carbon dioxide gas, which there's a shortage of at the moment. So we've got a problem. How do we stun animals in a way that's acceptable to right. the Muslim community and to the vegan community, which doesn't want us to kill animals at all? Now, it's an interesting thing you bring that up. Uh, let me just finish this point, then we get straight to John, because we did go to KFC. And we did get some of that wonder meat, the one that's, you know, synthetically produced from plants and then deep fried and made to look like chicken meat. And she wouldn't even eat that. She wouldn't even feed the, uh, uh, the fake bacon that uh, we had just so yeah. she can try it because she's ingrained in herself that I, I don't want to even taste food that is like food that is unclean yeah. because that's in its own right unclean. And I just felt it's not so much that she's missing out, but I feel like it was so uh closed off to things that in her own holy sense wouldn't have any purview or perspective on whether or not it was holy or not like this is completely a uh a fabrication of of a food and not tied to the unclean stuff that she she has sworn herself off to why not try it but i i, I mean it's just one of those things george mm. go on ahead you want to throw in some more stuff i just wanted to say that um there, there was a um, company in the American Midwest, a slaughterhouse uh, mm. outfit that is um, Orthodox Jewish, and they have been dragged across the coals about cruelty in their slaughtering method, mm. um, which I, I cannot remember what it was, but it sounded pretty grotesque to me mm. when I heard, heard it described. I mean, I think when vegans say that they don't want to eat meat, they can do it on a, not a political basis, but on the stance of morality and ethical level and saying, hey, I'm not eating these particular foods. Yes, I'm healthy because I'm eating a non-Western diet, really. 
but I'm also making the choice that I'm not eating food that's, you know, cause excess harm to all these additional animals. And yeah. I get that too. I listen, I totally get the reason why people do um, like vegan keto and, and like if they do weight watchers, if they take a more exercise diet, like I get all the principles. What I, what I, what I worry about though, is when it starts to extend away from uh, a dietary constraint to more of a lifestyle choice and then dictate conscious moves that aren't even related to food whatsoever and more of like determining what is societally valuable or, or good or morally ethical or not. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, this is sounding more than just a diet. This is actually sounding like a life philosophy. And like, are we, are we applying the same levels of skepticism to that as we would to like law or to like God beliefs or anything like that? Or are we giving anything a free pass to get through just because a lot of other people are doing it and it's particularly fashionable and makes you look good? Because <laughs> there's a lot of things that could do that that could lead to bad stuff. Larry, do you have a final comment? Um, not really. Um, there's all kinds of dietary rules out there. Some of them are based in religion, some of them aren't. Um, it's, it's a mismatch of all kinds of input. Um, whatever gets you to your desired weight, I think is valid. So, mm. but I think it all comes down to what you were talking about. Um, calor caloric deficit in, in total. Basically that's the science behind it. John, right. what's up? Well, I'm wondering how far away you have to go from the original intention of these taboos, these dietary taboos that are religiously based because mm. Originally, it was, you know, dislike of the pig's lifestyle, which sure. turned them off, turned them off uh, eating pig meat. Sure. And sim similarly, in other parts of the world with other types of religion. But now we can make ersatz, the German word, meat using either plant protein or, you know, lab grown in a Petri dish type of meat. How far away are we going to have to get before they find it acceptable? Right, right. Like, if you were to think about it, tribe wise, if you had a tribe that by religion rules said don't eat other people, and another tribe that was like cannibalism is okay, the one that, you know, forbid cannibalism probably can afford more energy building schools and roads and, yeah. and, and an economy because they aren't worried about the guy behind them trying to eat them yeah. <laughs> all the time. Well, yeah, so, yeah. so there's some, you know, when you think about it, it's not necessarily like religion has a monopoly on not being a cannibal. Like you can figure that out even from a completely secular set. But the fact that it was explicitly described in certain books of like, these are the meats that you're allowed to eat. These are meats that you're not allowed to eat. It was like, okay, cool. But, you know, I think my main, oh, Larry, I see you raising your hand. I, I'll, I'll just conclude real quick. The main takeaway is that like, hey, rules, have intentions behind them. And when you stray away from those intentions, now you have to ask yourself, what are these additional consequences of these new um, meanings that I'm giving to them? Larry, what do you think? I was just gonna say that religions are dogma not only dogmatic, but they're authoritarian. Yep. And they're pretty much authoritarian and expect obedience in every um, facet of life. And it would be amazing or surprising if they didn't also dictate certain uh, foods mm. that you could eat and, and couldn't eat. Uh, right. You see that in pretty much every religion. Mm. Right, right. And and I think the intention of religious dogma is authority and obedience. Right. It's not so much like, I really care about you being healthy and losing weight. It's like, no, right. I want you to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Authoritarianism. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> right. Okay. You, raised, you raised an interesting can of worms when you brought up cannibalism, because of Talk course, you, you could make a strong case for the, the virtues of cannibalism, because eating humans, you, you know you're going to get all the nutrition that you need to make a human in the right proportions. <laughs> <laughs> not if you're an American. It was like, oh, it's kind of Well, maybe not, no. maybe not. <laughs> I thought you were going to say can of fingers. Yeah. You had the perfect opportunity right there, too. Uh, <laughs> yes. But so the thing is, thing is, of course, cannibalism was going on right up until the 1960s in the Philippines, um, somewhere like that. Okay. So I don't know whether it was religious, but uh, they certainly thought that it was okay to eat their dead. Yeah, and not to get this is a sciencey show, so I'll, I'll jump into it. But there are these things called prions, which are like yeah, yeah. poorly yeah. folded proteins that mm. are only a problem if you need those exact kind of amino acid chains as well. So, mm. like, you can inherit diseases in a sense from mm. protein that's too similar to your protein because your body sees it as like, oh, perfect, I know exactly where to put this. But that thing has a structural problem that can yes. cascade 
into more yes. problems around your body. Yes. If you aren't familiar with this, you may have heard of mad cow disease. Um, yes. It's why yes. we don't eat certain parts of cow because there's yeah. enough commonality that can give us problems as well. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yeah, like I can definitely see some meaningful restrictions of like, hey, don't eat this part of a cow. It can cause mm. you harm. It can make you sick. Mm. And that that's not good for you versus a religious point of view of listen to me, obey me. And by the way, don't eat this cow. But if you don't eat the cow, it's fine. Yeah. Just keep obeying me. Yeah. I'll throw one last thing out too. Um, spongy, spongy form and capillopathy. Ugh, you make it, uh, <laughs> it sounds great in that accent though. It sounds better than if I were to say it. Kreutzfeld Jakob disease. You don't want it. Let me, so I'm going to turn your audio levels a bit good lower. All right. So here's, here's my other point. We have basically a culture that has a series of gods from all around the world, based on whatever your geopolitical persuasion is, you might find yourself nestled into a God belief from birth, right? And as much as we are critical about, you know, whether paleo is the right kind of diet to go or veganism is actually effective or reasonable or vegetarian is the way to go or a weekend vegetarian or intermittent fasting or Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, there's so many names. We can be critical and sit back on our table and be like, oh yeah, but it's caloric deficit. That's fine. I feel like that's sort of like the atheist perspective on a lot of these things, just breaking it down into the non-fun scientific terms. But for gods, we don't really apply, I think on mass, the same level of skepticism that would afford us a more consistent diet, dietary choices on which God to listen to by virtue of the fact that there's so many different gods to listen to. And if we were to just to say like, let's just figure out what works and what doesn't work. Let's just spend one week <laughs> praying to Vishnu, one week praying to Shiva. And if not, yeah. and nothing happens, we'll just switch to the next one until one works. And then we'll be like, okay, you made it to the next level. We'll do it American Idol style. What do you think, John? Like, wouldn't well, that be a good way? Certainly would. But another thought has crossed my mind because if we're made in God's image, mm. then presumably he has a diet which we, <laughs> we should be copying. There you go. What's God's <laughs> diet? And where are we going to go? Anyway, we're going to get ready for a break soon. I think that's a great point. Larry, go on and take us out. Yep. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Resume. Five, four, three, two. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Dowder Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now let's talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville for just a moment. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 20th year, and we have over 1,000 members, and we have weekly in-person meetings in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. So if you're in the Knoxville area, come by Barley's on Tuesday evenings and see if you can find the group. Look for us inside at the high top tables, usually the loudest and happiest group there. If you'd like to join our Tuesday evening virtual <laughs> Zoom meeting, email us at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org, or you can send it to letschatse at gmail.com. Mm. You can also find the group on Facebook, meetup.com, or, or just directly to knoxvilleatheist.org. Uh, by the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start, Start one. one. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? I want to I want to touch a little bit more on this dietary dogma, and then we can go into some listener comments. I have okay. a I have a comment that I love everyone's feedback on, and it's I think the government was lying to us. <laughs> So maybe George can get some kicks out of this. I ain't so. But the idea is, is there's something called the food pyramid. Did you ever see that growing up as a yeah, kid? Yeah. Uh -huh. You have like this pyramid that tells you the proportions of food you're supposed to eat, starting with bread on the bottom or grains, mm -hmm. and then meat, poultry, and then as you go up, diet, uh, dairy, and then finally sweets at the very top of the pyramid in that small little triangle. The problem is, is that if you follow that kind of diet, you're actually going to have some, a lot of problems because you're going to fill yourself up with a lot of simple carbohydrates that mm -hmm. will make you feel more hungry and not feel as satiated as you want to be. And you'll end up overeating, as the pyramid tells you to do, on a bunch of carbohydrates that have a bunch of caloric calories that will basically turn into fat. And I was asking myself, why did, why did the pyramid look like that? And it's because 
we have lobbies, unfortunately, in America that dictate what the government will say. So groups of companies that have a sway on the overall messaging of these certain things. And when they were making the food pyramid, it originally looked like a completely different. It was just a circle saying, these are the great foods to eat. But then the bread grain company came in and was like, hey, by the way, we make corn. If you say nine times as much corn as you want, we'll give you this much money. And the politician said, oh, that sounds great. I love it. And then dairy came in and was like, I know you're not supposed to drink other animal milk, but how about you put us in there too and we can make this work out. And it completely skewed the way how I was educated on how to eat growing up. And a lot of the reasons why I was made it easy to lose weight was just an awareness of, I was not necessarily being lied to, but I had very bad information that was given to me with an agenda that was not in my best interest. And, and so I'm wondering, I've learned that there's problems with the Western diet. You don't just eat until you're full. You don't just drink until you're thirsty. You have to eat good food. And I had to figure out what those good foods were. John, did you have, do you have a similar issue overseas? Is, is there a program that tells you what food you're supposed to eat? And is it accurate towards an actual healthy diet? We did, going back many years. After World War II, we were still on a, a, a um, what's the word? A, not a diet, but we were on rations. Ah, or that's like the a... word. Thank you. Rations right through until about 1953. Mm. Uh, and we couldn't eat sweets. There was no sugar available. Wow. Wow. And, wow, wow. OK. Uh, and we had a, a generation of people that grew up that weren't obese because of the foods that were available in their childhood and teenage. Right. And then the American big companies arrived. The first McDonald's opened in, oh, I, didn't no! say, I didn't say that, did I? The first, um, the first, McDog, the, the first McDog meat opened in, uh, <laughs> in London with his maxi shakes, you know? Mm, yeah. I don't seem to have them so much now, but, and then there's a company which specializes in very sugary cola, which I, I won't mention the name, but uh, I, I suspect that those sorts of things have been responsible for uh, an outbreak of obesity in the US of A and it's coming here too. Right, I think so. Uh, Larry, when you were in the Navy, right? Like, did yeah. you, was there any sort of food-based sponsors or did the military at least have a program that was, these are the foods we recommend to eat as a, as a sailor and this is actually <clears> better <throat> for you to eat than what civilians are eating. Like, was there... Was there any guidance in that? There really wasn't a lot of guidance. Uh, when you're on a ship, you eat what they give you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can't go over to the fast food places. And you're usually out for a couple of weeks at a time. So it helps right. tend to keep your, uh, your weight down. Of course, when you're in port, mm. uh, a lot of sailors have their own apartments. So it was just like going to work every day. So you could, you could definitely become obese that way. Wow. Um, but as a young man, you generally stayed active. So the younger ones didn't get very fat course the the lifers tended to that, that definitely see it. here's <laughs> yeah. the thing that blows my mind every single time i see it it's when you see like olympic athletes and then there's a banner for coca-cola as an ad behind them and you're like you said the words hey i can say it. i'm calling them out i'm calling out but it's like that is not a sponsor of a sports drink yet it's like a guy climbing up the mountain there's like an ad and he reaches yeah. in his back and there's a nice ice cold coca-cola i'm like don't eat drink he would he would spit that out yeah. the thing about the thing about coca-cola now we've outed it All is right. <laughs> it's very it's very clever because you feel thirsty so you want a drink right. and they offer you a drink which doesn't quench your thirst wow in fact, you imbibe more water needing sugar mm. and therefore need another one. That's, right. that's, why, that's why you have free refills. Mm, very true. Yeah, and it's a cheap thing to make and charge money for too. Yeah, George yeah. Brown, I'm going to shop for you specifically against coffee. How about this? Uh, coffee obviously has caffeine. Obviously, there's a, problem, a lot of people that love caffeine. I don't have a problem with drugs in general, right? But I'm saying the idea that we have as a society deemed this, what's the right word to call it? Is it a psychotropic or is it a psychoactive drug to be completely okay? It's like, this is an okay psychoactive drug. You can have it. You can put sugar in it. You can feed it to kids. You can make candy taste after it. It's all good. But, but anything else, not okay. I just find that the, the, the hypocrisy of it a little bit. 
Well, I want to get back to your food pyramid, actually. Go for it, George. Because um, for many years, I have not trusted the food pyramid. And I'm aware that politicians get bought by contributions to their campaign funds. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, um, and so the prevalence of that food pyramid has made me um, slightly distrustful of government agencies of all kinds mm. because I can't trust the data that they're giving me. And I think it has affected my health. And I think so, too. I think so, too. Mm -hmm. I think it's affected my health and many others as well. I'll throw this out at you as well. We can't trust. We know the government has lied. We see documents on this about the food pyramid, and we know it's accurate, scientifically unsound un and fabricated information. And we see the detrimental effects of it. Why can't we as a society apply that same level of skepticism to religion? Because we see in practice detrimental effects of raising kids in very closed off dogmas. We see, you know, bigots fall part and parcel out of very doct uh, conservative points of view, very uh, indoctrinated points of view, or probably yeah. a better word for it. And I well, the, George, the reason is it. the reason is because there are certain agreed upon subjects which are taboo and other subjects which are not. Oh, so, I hate for, this. for instance, uh, you know, my religion is cool, but your religion is a cult. Right, 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 right. It's like my dream. <laughs> we were talking about food. <laughs> sure, sure. But and, it's um, the same thing. It's the same thing. I feel like it's the same thing with coffee. It's same thing with Coca-Cola. Same thing with like foods. It's like people have their in club and then the out club is not acceptable or anyway. But yeah, I'm sorry. You're making a great point, George. So we got well, listener let's... comments too? Yes. Let's fill out the rest of the show with some listener comments. Uh, we have... Cool. Can couple I, oh go for it john can i just mention all you can eat yes that's that's not a thing over here that's not a you don't have buffets you don't you don't find that in europe very much we've got one restaurant which does all you can eat for lunchtime on a sundays because that's when they need the business but apart from that it isn't a thing very so no smorgasbords yeah, well that's different isn't it you can you can pick and choose lots of different types of food. Uh, and we have uh, the Spanish tapas, for example. But it's not all you can eat mm. for, for a set fee. You know, that, that's encouraging gluttony. Now, you don't have bottomless bowls or anything like that? <laughs> no. no. Buffet is a French word. It seems weird that it doesn't exist in Europe. So I'll, I'll, I'll no, buffet, buffet exists, but not, you know, unlimited food for a set price i'm confused what is a buffet if not that a, a buffet is a range of food on a table that you can walk up and and take from but it it's not it's not like an all-you-can-eat restaurant where they try and force extra food on you where you know it's it, it's just selection uh -huh. rather than quantity Okay. Okay. I think I get it. I think I get it. It's very nuanced, but I think I definitely feel like I get it. All right. So uh, listeners comments. Thank you guys so much for leaving comments. I'm reading comments from my YouTube channel. Let's chat. Feel free to leave a comment on the show. We'll go over it. Uh, last week, we were talking about, is it child abuse to raise your kid religiously? And there was some, all three comments, as far as I'm aware, deal with a point that we made regarding um, is disciplining the same thing as abuse. And so uh, what the first question we had is, what if parents never knew anything better? Uh, this came from Data's trading room. What if parents didn't know anything better? And if they raise a kid in a specific culture, maybe they spank the kid. Is that considered abuse as well? And so we can go on a round table on this first question. Uh, John Richards, if a parent doesn't know any better and they spank their kids as a form of instilling discipline, is that child abuse? Yes. Okay. Because if you, if you go back in history, there would have been even worse examples where children would have been severely tortured. And, mm. and, and ignorance, ignorance of a good way to behave doesn't excuse you. I, I actually interview people who were abused as children mm. and, and they're very angry, let me tell you. They are campaigning to try and prevent this happening and make very different parents themselves. Mm. Larry, throw it at you. You also got kids. Well, so. you know, like John said, uh, I, I have to agree. 
there were cultures that even abandoned children if they had too many kids or if they thought the child didn't measure up or maybe a female. Um, I think it was the Spartans that would like leave them in jars next to the road or something. But uh, yeah, uh, ignorance is no excuse. Uh, there's, you know, there's no shown good reason to be violent towards a child. Interesting. I mean, John, it makes, in my opinion, it makes me mistrust you. Okay. George, you have thoughts on this? You also have sons. I, I do. You know, it's spare the rod and spoil the <clears throat> child. It's um, uh, you have abuse that is sanctioned by large portions of society. Yeah. But what the bottom line of this is, regardless of what the society do, uh, condones or not, the bottom line is how is the child affected? It's going to be for the rest of the kid's life. Mm. And, um, you know, so it is abuse, even though um, maybe the whole society agrees, oh, yeah, let's, let's uh, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. It, it is still abuse as the child experiences it. Okay. Interesting round table. I don't really, so like I don't have children, though I do have pets and I've, I've moved away from, you know, spray bottles of water to like air cans. And I found that to be like, they're not wet an hour later and, and still figuring out why am I still wet? Because they don't have a long-term memory. <laughs> but if you spray the air can, they're like, what was that? And then they'll stop doing whatever it is and then go back to being a cat later on. It's really good. Can I make uh, a, can yeah, I go make for it, John. Recommendation to you, Ty. Sure. What's up? I think that small humans make the best pets. Small humans make the best pets. <laughs> I can tell you this. This is going to get dark very quickly, but I can lose a, I can lose a cat and not go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and cats don't generally wail for four hours at a time. <laughs> right, 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 right. They come home potty trained from, yeah. from, right from the kennel. It's great. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw this one, a new comment. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Should they be penalized? It's just literally that. So in the event, so to fill this out, in the event that we do realize that it is child abuse to raise your kid religiously, should they be penalized, um, a parent? And if so, what should be the penalty? We'll throw it up to John Richards first. What do you think? We, we, we touched on this last week, didn't we? When we decided that uh, they shouldn't be exposed to religion, except under PG guidance, didn't we? <laughs> So it is okay in your rule to do it if there's parental guidance present. Are we talking about cap, uh, corporal punishment? Or are we talking about raising? This is raising your child okay. in religion. And, right. and, and the comment is literally just, I mean, should they be penalized? And so I'm imagining that they're referring to if the parent raises their kid in a religious environment, and we do contone that as child abuse, what is the penalty for it? And, or if we all agree that it's child abuse, what do you think, Larry? Well, I think that... Um... If, if you're caught speeding and you do it a lot, uh, they may send you to a class to explain to you, you know, why this isn't a good idea and show you the repercussions and, and problems with it. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe something like that. It's not, we're not talking fines or jail time or anything like that, just uh, showing them that there's a better way. Right. And you're talking about doing that for the parents, not the kids, right? right. right. Okay. Okay. It's like, hey, we caught you, you know, indoctrinating your kid just going to show you what's up mm -hmm. you know i kind of like also the pg-13 rating that we came up with before it's like hey if you're a parent you can do it but there's going to be a little tag next to every little thing being like this requires parental guidance don't just uh -huh. be some random kid walking around with this stuff you know right. the, 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 trouble is, the, the trouble is if you withdraw mm -hmm. uh, beating halfway through a child's upbringing then all hell breaks loose because they think they can do anything. Mm. I can tell you about it. There are other repercussions that you can apply. You can ground them. You can take away their allowance. You can, yes. you know, a lot of well, things. There are, there are, but it takes a while for those to bed in and to be regarded as serious. I can tell you about a headmaster who came and took over a school I was teaching at. And previously we'd had caning. This is going back, you know, almost 50 years when that was the normal thing in most of the Western world. And this new headmaster came in and stood up in the assembly and he said, there will be no more caning. Interesting. Now, he, he, he could have not told them. He could have just introduced the policy and let them find out over the course of the next several months and years. Mm -hmm. But he 
hold them. And guess what? It had some of the curious effects. Some of the kids had crazy, and some of the kids were like, "I'm." I actually respect that he came out and told us that straight out. Like no, I no, can. No. It, it, it was the naughty ones who were completely unfettered. Sure. They, they they wrecked the place in no time at all. I'll tell you this right now. That's not the fault of all the kids that were there, though. That's still like, how do I put it? I I can't make much of a time machine, but the kids that will destroy a system like that would have done so in some respect regardless either way and like the notion that a kid needs to be beaten in to to get respect out of is one that i will frequently challenge in Absolutely. fact the, the horses they don't need to be broken in but if they have been broken in lived under that regime and then it's ah, taken away ah i see what you're saying it creates a power struggle something like that so yeah maybe there's better ways of doing it but you know i think i think i respect the teacher who's willing to treat me like an adult uh, from the get-go even if that may have uh, a juvenile response right but like he stopped the immediate harm and then and and let whatever fallout happen and we can move forward from there i think it falls right into this next comment though uh trading room uh what's up george what's up well i just want to make a comment that um i would wish for the abusers, in other words, the parents in this situation, to somehow be educated. I think that as a society, we need to focus on abusive behavior of people who are in charge in general, because there is so much of it. Sure. And um, now how we are going to educate the people is another story. Sure. I have no answer about how to go about it, how to how to get their attention. Sure. Also, no. I feel like you can't necessarily take away the stick and then no. expect complete obedience immediately afterwards. It needs to be supplicated with a less harmful system. So if he just says, I'm not going to punish you anymore and walks away and expect that to resolve things no. without some sort of secondary system for. Yeah helping mm -hmm. obedience, there's a problem. Though I do feel like overall between the two systems of continuing harm and not continuing harm, obviously not continuing harm is the improvement. Yeah. But yeah. Well, we've seen this happen certainly over my lifetime mm -hmm. as a nation, because coming out of World War II, there was a lot of military released on the public mm -hmm. and they had military rules in their heads. Right. They'd been institutionalized in to be how, how to behave. Right. And the rest of society at that time was very deferential. It was, yes, sir, you know, how high would you like me to jump, sir? But that has all gone away. And now we have a disrespectful society that challenges authority all the time, which is much better. For progress and for, uh, for change, yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, it was falling right into our next comment right here from Dada's Trading Room again. Like uh, he says, I am a 62 year old man and I was actually abused by my father growing up in the sense that he would often whip my butt with a leather belt for anything I did that he interpreted as disobedience. Why did he act like that? Because he was very neurotic. And in those days, there was the notion that a child had to be broken in, even in schools. There was, I mean, this wasn't everywhere, but there were teachers who would spank a kid's palm with a ruler or place them to stand in the corner of a classroom. No dunce hats, guys. But as far as religion in my country, especially in the communist days, this is a common story to tell. And so uh, feeding right into the story that you're saying, John, like the idea of like corporal punishment being done in school. I went to a school in Georgia that had that as a system. When I found out about it, I thought it was the most bizarre concept I've ever heard of. Like mm. there was the guy who's paid to slap kids butts <laughs> yeah yeah oh they, like and then in in 2020 terms it was just like how is that not a lawsuit every single time it just seems yeah. very bizarre it's like how do you well, even apply for a job like that that's crazy it was victorian that, it came out of the victorian mm. know, the culture of queen victoria's uh, population really okay okay but yeah like the idea of okay this system is it in fact abuse and i would say yes and if it's directed towards kids i'd say it's child abuse even in the event that the person's ignorant of it and it's not so much a question of do this or without it everything's going to chaos it's more of like stop abusing and try to find a better system to instill obedience right because mm. it doesn't have to be one way or the other there's there's much room for compromise here and i i feel like while i'm not in a position to tell anyone else how to raise their kid 
I can at least speak for the kid's behalf and saying they don't like getting beaten and you wouldn't like it either if you were a child in a similar situation. So um, we have to take care of ourselves and your child's are a part of you, right? And in the sense, stretching this out, so as we get to our closing terms, um, there is the sense of taking care of yourself through your family, but also yourself through just what you consume and eat on a regular basis, right? And I would say if you're in America and you're listening to this, the Western diet is, is a well-known bad thing to be on in a sense. And it's not an example of like, hey, stop eating Twinkies, stop eating donuts, all that pizza and stuff like that. If you have a craving and you can go for it, do it, but do so in moderation. And if you maintain a deficit afterwards, you will lose weight, you will be healthy, or you could maintain the weight that you're at right now if you're happy with where you're at. But don't eat to excess or to satiation on bad food that America is known for because it's not good for you. Uh, that would be my final points. George, what's up? Fine well, the, the problem that I have is that who are we going to trust for dietary advice? Good question. Because there are so many quacks out there mm. who will tell us whatever, you know, and lack of regulation for, let's say, the, the natural food industry or the, the vitamin business. I mean, it's, it's a Wild West show. Right. Who do I trust? Boy, I have no answer for this. I would also throw this out to the exact same way how we deal with uh, manners of child rearing or science. It's not so much getting a bunch of facts and working with those bunch of facts because it is a science. Nutritionists follow scientific protocols and science changes, right? And so we are constantly learning better ways of how to keep ourselves healthy. And so it's not so much a matter of who do you listen to, but what's a good way for me to know true things from false things, right? And let me work. And the best way you do that is by asking questions and being skeptical of everything, not just things that you want to be true and give those a free pass. And if you question everything, and if you're skeptical, of even the things that you are adherent to, and because you're willing to change it for better information, I guarantee you'll fall to the same, you know, objective truth that everyone else is leading towards. It's just a question of constantly being willing to question everything. And it's not a fact that it's a bad thing to do. It's actually a very healthy thing to do. So start with a healthy mindset of questioning and being skeptical first. And then I guarantee you, if you follow that pathway, you'll get to the truth. Guaranteed. You don't have to take my word for it, but don't no question what I say too. Question, <laughs> question even that. Uh, let's see. Larry, uh, do you got final words on the subject for today's show? Oh, you're on mute, my friend. I think I pretty much covered uh, what I wanted to say about it. Okay, cool. John okay. Richards, plug me. And final words. Free Thought Productions. That's my channel. And it's where I've not only been doing Global Atheist News for over a year and Free Thought Hour for more than two years in various forms, but I've also started recently doing Thought for the Day Debunked, which Yay! is- Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. So, so is this is a weekly thing now too, or is it a separate series well, of videos? What's it's going on almost a, It's almost a daily thing because the, the BBC churns them out every day, except Sunday. And so they give me plenty of things to debunk. I'm having fun. Good for you. Good for you, man. BBC, what are you doing? What are you doing though? Or you're like, you're like the lone soul superhero on top of that castle behind you being like, not today, not today. <laughs> Debunk man, something like that. We'll figure it out anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Larry, uh, feel free to uh, close out the show. It doesn't do on radio, does it? That gesture. Right. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Well, my my content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, uh, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject of atheism. I do have a book out there called Atheism, What's It All About? Available on Amazon. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, just search for Doubter5 or Larry Rhodes. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or let's chat se at gmail.com and we'll answer them on future shows. If you're having trouble leaving your religious beliefs behind, you can get help at recoveringfromreligion.org. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for joining us at the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember, you can find this show on Apple iTunes, Pocket Cast, Amazon, and other podcasts everywhere. 
Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Yep. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Bye.